whatever might have been keeping you from getting yourself up off the ground, maybe there's something standing in your way preventing you from crossing that finish line. We gotta move past that. It's time to strike a match. It's time to find the fire that was burning a passion and desire for something greater than ourselves. It's time to find the spark. It's time to reignite. Yes, you were, you were happy to tell each other you look good today. I get, I get that. I mean, you are looking good today. I can look around. I can see that. So, um, today is a special day. It's our Vision Sunday as a church. If we've never met, my name is TJ, um, pastor here at Refresh. And uh, I, I think today's very special because it kind of it's a, a, a demarcation between what was and what will be. It's a, it's a moment where you get to celebrate all the things that God did in 2021, but then we get to turn our eyes towards 2022 and kind of run for a new horizon, right? Like, I love that. I, I think that's why New Year's are special. Don't you think that? Like, that's why this time of year is special for people because they're like, great. I'm going to leave some things in 2021, and I'm going to run towards these other things. And as spiritually, I think we should do that today. So uh, before we do that, though, I want to remind you, this is our week of prayer. It starts today. And so I've been talking to you guys about prayer, about fasting every single week, getting you ready for this week. And so I've taken time and I've filmed different video clips every single day this week. And we've got them available. Um, they, an email went out. It's on all of our social media. It's, you, it's readily available. And what I did in each one of the videos is teach you how to pray. Because a lot of people go, TJ, I would love to pray, but by the time I get about five minutes in, I've prayed for every person I know, I've prayed for every country I can remember, I've prayed for every like official in my life, you know, like my, my principal or, or my boss, I've prayed for everyone I know, and I'm like four minutes and 36 seconds into my prayer time, what do I do now, right? And so to answer that question, what do I do now, I actually taught, I'm going to teach you guys how to pray this week through those videos. And then after the video concludes, it's just music for about 15 minutes so that you can do what you do. So you can put into practice what you just learned. The entire video is about 20 minutes. Some of them I think are maybe 25 minutes. So this week I'm asking you, will you set aside that time on purpose? Not like, oh, if I can get to it, but dedicate a time. They go live at 6 a.m. every day which I will not be watching it at 6 a.m. I'll be watching it maybe a little later than that. But you guys who are early birds, God bless your heart. Um, that's why I pre-recorded these, so I don't have to get up with you and, uh, and do it live, okay? Uh, so if you want to do it live at noon, we can handle that. Anybody on that train, the noon live train? That's me, okay? That's what I will be doing. All right, so here, here let's, let's dive in um, to this week. Uh, today we're going we're gonna to celebrate what happened last year. And last year was a big year for our church, because it's the year our church started. We are not very old as a church. Um, I've lost count. I think this is maybe like our 17th service, 16th service, something like that. Um, so we're finally starting to get a rhythm. We're starting to understand, oh, that's how you do things. Great. Um, but last year was great. In those 13 services, we're going to celebrate that. And then the second half of the service today, we're going to look forward to what is coming. And uh, when you came in, you more than likely got a confetti thing, one of these. They, they, this one has like an aerosol can at the bottom, and this one's like manual powered. <laughs> so they looked at you and they thought, they need this one, right? <laughs> they do not look trustworthy. They'll probably look at it and just blast it in their face or something. So, um, if you got one of these, they either really like you or really dislike you. So they're like, they're praying and hoping. So, these ones, uh, let me give you, these ones are easy. You just twist, it goes pop, it's easy. These ones, you got to take the little uh, cap off the end. Some people struggle with the cap. It's very easy, as you just saw. And then you, you have to say pop. Because it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't make any noise. So you have to like, woo! Like, so, so you have to do something, okay? Because um, we're going to have a party in a minute. Like halfway through this sermon, I'm going to ruin the flow of the entire service. And we're going we're gonna to have a party. To celebrate something, okay? We're gonna make a mess because parties are messy and they're fun and they're loud and they're smiling and they're full of joy. So we're gonna do that in just a minute. But before we celebrate something, I gotta I gotta talk about what we're celebrating. Alright? So we're gonna go to the book of Luke, chapter 15. We're gonna kick it off right there to talk about what we're gonna celebrate. Um, uh, and, and 
Well, actually, okay, let me do this. Sorry, I got ahead of myself on my notes. I got to check myself before I get too far along. Um, since it's Vision Sunday, let me read you our vision statement before we move any further, before I jump into Luke 15. And here's the vision statement. We desire to see every person refreshed and every purpose discovered. If you've gone through our discovery class, you've heard me say this. If you've watched some of our videos online, we've heard variations of this. But at the end of the day, the thing that we want is to see every single person within our reach refreshed by the presence of God and set free by Him. And then the second half of that is that we want to see every purpose discovered. Every single person has a purpose from God. And once they come into relationship with Him, it's not the end of the story, but it's the beginning of a brand new story. And so we have purpose in him. And the ultimate way we find fulfillment in life is actually discovering what that purpose is in living for it. That's how it works. So, so our goal as a church isn't to uh, build these big programs or anything like that. To, we want to see individuals refreshed and individuals discover their purpose. And I believe that enough individuals are refreshed and discover their purpose, it's going to change everything. Because it's like, like snow. Couple snowflakes, not a big deal. But we know that if you get enough of them together, it's gonna to make a difference. Listen, you may feel like you're just one person. I'm just trying to live one little purpose. But if you look around the room, there's a lot of us here. If we all start living on purpose, it's gonna change some things, right? Yeah. It's gonna add more people. We're gonna keep reaching people. We're gonna start changing the world because we are refreshed while we're living in purpose. And when you live in purpose, you bring refreshing to new people. And those people are refreshed and they discover their purpose. You see how that works? So that's the two halves of our sermon today. First half is refreshing. Second half is purpose. Refreshing, I want to look back at last year and talk about refreshing. Luke chapter 15, chapter, uh, chapter 15, verse 1 and 2. This is Jesus. He's speaking. And it says, tax collectors and other notorious sinners. Now, you've done dumb things, bad things in your life, I'm sure, just like me. But were you famous for being a sinner? Like, notorious <laughs> sinners. Like, like, did you have, like, a reputation? You were infamous when it came to all the bad things that you've done. You don't have to raise your hand. Just think about that for a minute. This is the kind of people Jesus is hanging with, okay? And often, they came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and the teachers of the religious law complain that he was associating with sinful people, even eating with them. Because if he was eating with them, he had to like them. And if he liked them, they, they were like the lowest of the low of the people. And the religious leaders, they didn't associate with those kind of in our culture, don't we have those kind of people, depending on what your ideology is, right? Like we have, whether it's a political thing, whether it's a so social thing, whether it's an economic thing, we all have those kind of people that we can be tempted to look down on, right? And so Jesus has two groups of people before him. The first group of people is the lowest of the low, and the, and the, and the other group of people is supposed to be the highest of the high. But when you look at the heart and the attitude towards Jesus, it's the lowest of the low that is actually the highest of the high. And it's the highest of the high, and it's actually the lowest of the low. So he's got these two groups of people, and he starts to tell stories in Luke 15. He actually tells three stories. I'm going to paraphrase the first two. The first story is about a shepherd. He said the shepherd has 100 sheep, and one of them gets lost. So he leaves the 99 sheep, and he goes and he finds the one. And when he finds it, he comes back, and he calls his friends, and he says, let's have a party, because the sheep that I had lost is now found. It's my, my flock is now whole again. And Jesus says, in heaven, the same thing is happening. For one sinner, on this side, sinner, that repents and comes to me, then over the 99 that are already there. And then he tells another story. He says, a woman lost a coin. She had 10 coins and she lost one and she lit a lamp and she swept the floor and she found her coin and she called her friends and they're like, let's have a party because my coin, this very valuable coin that I lost, I found it. And again, Jesus says, there is rejoicing in heaven. The angels are throwing a party over one lost person that returns than over the others who are still around. You see, he's telling a story about the two groups of people that are before him. The sinners, notorious sinners, and the people who are supposed to have it all together. And one is looking down at the other, one feels rejected by the other, right? There's this distance, this gulf. And Jesus is saying, listen, this side, the 99, the 9, God's happy you're a part of this. But there is so much joy when the lost are found. There's party in heaven. 
And then he goes and he tells the third story. The first one was one out of 100. The next one was one out of 10. And this one's one out of two. A father had two sons. And the younger son came to the father and he said, hey, uh, I want my share of my inheritance now before you die. And if my kid said that to me, I'm like, well, you're going to die now. So it's <laughs> terrible over, right? Like, <laughs> Because he, he just said to his dad, I'd rather have you dead and have your things than to have a relationship with you. You're dead, right? Like, that's what I would do. He's like, you're, you're no way. But in Jesus' story, the father goes, okay, here you go. And the son goes off to a distant country, and he has lots of friends because he's spending lots of money. But when the money runs out, so do his friends. And he finds himself alone. There's a famine in the land, and he cannot find work he cannot find food. He cannot do anything. And so he finds a job feeding pigs. And he's so hungry that he's longing for the food that the pigs are eating. And as a Jewish young man, living with an unclean animal would be the ultimate low of lows. And the Bible says that he came to his senses one day. And he realized, in my father's house, the servants are living better than I am right now. He goes, maybe, maybe here's what I'll do. I'll go back and ask my dad, can I just be a servant in your house? Because it's better than the life I'm living right now. And so he gets his speech together. When you were a kid, did you ever put a speech together before dad came home? <laughs> you see, what had happened was, uh, that's what he's doing. He's going, I'm going to go back to my dad. I'm going to say, I've sinned against heaven and against you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Can you make me one of your servants? And he goes, at least I'll be living. At least I'll have somewhere to live and something to eat. Because even those have been wiped away from his life. And the Bible says that this rotten smelling, rebellious kid started the journey home. And while he was a long way off, right? While he was a long way off. Let's read it together. Chapter 15, verse 20. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. If you were the son and you saw that the father saw you, you've got a little bit of time to rehearse your speech one more time. Is that what you're doing? That's what he's doing. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son and embraced him and kissed him. The slop-covered, smelly, rebellious kid embraced him and kissed him. And his son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. He's, he's starting to get into the speech. But his father completely ignores him and cuts him off mid-sentence, and he says, but his servant said to the servants, but his father said to the servants, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. It's like, like, could you imagine being the broken, dirty, nasty son coming up, going, oh my gosh, I wonder if he'll ever love me again, if he'll ever accept me again, if I can even come back from the house. And here he is, hugging you, embracing you, saying, go and get the best robe, which more than likely was hanging in the father's closet, right? He said, take the best thing we have and put it on this mess of a son of mine. And then he continues. And, and, and he says, get the ring and put it on his finger, because that's a, the, the signet of the family. He's back in the family. He's not just a, a, a kid. He's my son. So he puts the ring on his finger and puts sandals on his feet and kill the calf. We've been fattening. Kill the calf. We've been fattening. He's been, he's been preparing for the return of the son. He's been ready for the party to happen at any minute for the son to come home. He was anticipating this and kill the calf. We've been fattening. We must celebrate. It's not optional. You get, you get the words here? He's not like, oh, that's cool. Good story, bro. We must. It's imperative. It is not even an option. We must celebrate with a feast for this son of mine was dead and is now returned to life. He was lost, but now he's found. And I love this line. So, the party began. Isn't that awesome? Like, I, I don't know about you, but I'm like, I picture all of this going on in my head, and I think this kid's going, oh my gosh. I got dad's probe on. Oh my gosh. Like, and the party is just bumping and thumping, right? But here's the difference between this story and the other ones. 
The other story is Aang right there. Like, she found party done. Coin found party done. But Jesus takes it a little bit farther. He goes, meanwhile, the older son was doing what he was supposed to do the whole time. He was working in the fields. And when he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house. Now, I understand hearing music. But have you ever heard a person dance? <laughs> like, how, how hard are you partying if someone is on the way home and they're like, I hear dancing? That's some serious. There's some dancing going on, right? Anybody else? Does this strike you funny? Okay. He hears it. And so he asks one of the servants, what's going on? Why, what's, 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 what's the thump, thump, thump going on? And he goes, well, your brother's back. And your father has killed the fattened calf, and we're celebrating because of his safe return. We must celebrate. The party has begun. He's back safe, so we had to party. And you would think that a brother who loves his brother would be happy. Notorious sinners. Jesus is spending time with them. And the Pharisees, the religious leaders and teachers of the law, are appalled that Jesus would hang out with such broken and low-end people. You guys get where this story is that Jesus is telling? You understand that? Okay. Most preachers, when they preach, they preach about the younger son, but they never really talk about the older son. Because the older son isn't as fun to preach about. Because if I had to put myself in the equation of the two sons, I'm not the prodigal because I didn't leave and I'm not on my way home. I'm the older son. I'm the one who is supposed to be celebrating the brother coming home. But if I get too into my religiosity of it all, I end up like the older brother in this story. And so it's not a very fun passage to preach. It steps on some toes. And if you've been a Christian for a little while, this older brother, you're sitting in that seat. Does that make you uncomfortable? Sure makes me uncomfortable. Because we like our churches clean and not messy. We don't like to put the finest robe on the dirtiest people, do we? But Jesus is saying, we had to sell. We have to celebrate because the lost has been found. Let's continue with this brother. The older brother was angry and he wouldn't go in. His father came out and he begged him. But he replied, all these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to do. I've been serving for so long. I have shown up early to set up the church. I worked in the nursery. I played music. I did the sound. I ran a small group. I was at every outreach. And this guy walks in off the street, and you're happy to, happier to see him than you are to see me. How many people's toes hurt right now? Mine do. I'm talking to me, right? You, you oh, it hurts. All these years. And in that time, you never even gave me one goat. For a feast with my friends. <laughs> you get the fattened cat for him, not even a goat for me. All right. I don't know how significant that is. I don't know their culture that well. All right. <laughs> Yet, look at this language. When this son of yours, not this brother of mine, you guys get that? He's distancing himself. I am not like him. I am not like that person. This brother or son of yours comes back and squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fat calf. And his father said to him, look, dear son, you've always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. The inheritance of everything, it's yours. But we had to celebrate. You guys get that language? We had to celebrate. For your brother was dead and he's come back to you. He was lost, but now he's found. 
the older brother goes from this son of yours, and the father goes, no, this brother of yours. He may not look like you right now, but he's still your brother. Does that convict anybody else like it convicts me? So what, what, if, what if we decided to be the older brother that celebrates? You know what I'm saying? Like, like what if we were like the father, and we didn't, we didn't worry about what people look like, or smelled like, or where they were coming from, or what they had done with their life up to that point. But we decided we were going to celebrate the day that the lost were found. I think it's a part of it, right? So, I don't, I don't know about you. I'm feeling like we need to have a part. Anybody else? that 77 people discovered their gifts through our discovery classes. That's pretty cool, right? Okay. You can hold off on that because I'm going to make you do a lot more than just oh, that's wonderful. That's great. We're, we have to be like the father. Okay? we got to celebrate big, big, big. So we're, hold off on that and save it all up for one moment. You guys that? Because you got you to, some of you guys are yelling. Pop! In a minute. Okay. Did you know that there's 110 people on our service our church and our community. That's pretty good news, right? Yeah. Did you know that there are uh, 16 official small groups kicking off this week? Which is pretty amazing. We have as many small groups as many weeks as we've been around as a church. I don't know, that's pretty cool stuff. Did you know that in 2021, not 2022, 2021, we gave $25,893 to missions? Yeah. That's pretty, I think that's kind of cool, don't you? But there's one number that's more important than all the other numbers. And we can have 99 small groups. We can have 99,000 people serving. But if we have the one, that's when the party begins. And so, can you guys get on your feet with me for a minute? If you didn't get one of these, there's people around with them. So if you want to wave to the sides, I don't know, put your hand in there if you didn't get one. But I want you guys to celebrate with me today. And I'm going to count to five. We're going to do the whole thing all together, like pop, pop, pop. And some of you guys, you just, ah! okay, you got to do your thing. Uh, no, we're going to celebrate because we're celebrating the 21 people in 2021 that actually gave their life to Christ last year. Isn't that awesome?
vision of refresh, that's where it starts. Because the vision of refresh isn't even about the we or the us, it's about the individuals who know Christ, who come to know Christ. There's nothing more refreshing than starting a relationship with Jesus, amen? amen. There's nothing more refreshing than finding freedom from the brokenness and the hurts of your past in Christ, amen? amen? Right? But then we need to turn our attention to the next part of this message, which is not just celebrating what has happened, but turning our attention to what we desire to happen in the future. And so, in every person refreshed is what we've been talking about. But I want to actually talk about the discovery of purpose and how life-changing that can actually be. Because each one of us here, if you have said, I'm a believer, and you've just decided that's it, you're missing out on the other half of all that God has for you. There's so much more for you available. It's not just about finish line, I'm going to heaven. That's actually the starting line of what God has for you. And so today, what I want to do is I want to turn our attention, and we're going to go to the Old Testament. Now, I haven't really been able to teach out of the Old Testament yet uh, very much this year, or even since the inception of our church. And I love to teach Old Testament stories. But when you're, when you're starting a church, you got to start with Jesus, right? So we started with Jesus today, and we're going to go into the Old Testament. We're going to look at how purpose works in a person's life. And for those of you who are still distracted by the mess... We got a plan. We're going to clean it up, okay? In fact, you're a part of that plan. Uh, just a little FYI, okay? So it's okay. You can, you can just focus. If you're like me, like the mess is bothering you, and you're like, there's, there's a piece of confetti on their shoulder, and I can't, I can't worship. I can't listen until it's off. Anybody? Okay. Um, so every, <laughs> every second. Like, good. All right. We're going to go to the book of 1 Kings, chapter 19, and I'm going to set up a story like this. Uh, Elijah is the main character of the story. God used him to do incredible things. I mean, amazing, huge miracles. But at this point in Elijah's life, he went from the mountaintop to the darkest and the lowest of valleys to the point where he even prayed that he would die. He isolated himself. He felt depressed. He felt anxiety. He felt alone, and he just started to pray, God, you might as well kill me because there's nothing left for me. Talk about a bad day. Talk about a bad month because he went through this for months. And I know that there are a lot of you in this room that have felt the same way, maybe even right now. Was Elijah a follower of God? Absolutely. He was praying to God that he would die. So he's like thinking of God, right? He's a prophet of God who's done great things for God. He didn't leave God, but he felt like my time is done. I got nothing left. And so he finds himself on the mountain of God in a cave, this place where, where God was going to meet with him. He thought, maybe I could just go to this place, this desperate place of just trying to find something. And maybe that's why you walked in the doors of this church to begin with. Because you were like, you know what, I'm so desperate. Maybe this church plant that knows nothing about nothing will actually have something that I can deal with, right? You walked in the doors and you're like, okay, maybe there's something here. And that's maybe how you ended up here, just like Elijah, going, I, I'm at the end of everything. I don't know what's next. And then in verse 9, Elijah is in this cave and God begins to speak to him. But the Lord said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? doesn't seem like the most sensitive of um, questions to ask someone who's having like a really bad season, bad month, year, I mean, whatever, right? Like, what are you doing here? Like, usually when I ask that question, what are you doing here? It's like more like rhetorical, like, I kind of know why you're here, right? What are you doing here? Oh, I just can't get the popcorn in the movie, you know? What, like, whatever, that's, that's the language you use. But I think God's actually asking him a different question, and Elijah doesn't even realize it. He's not like, hey, what do you need? He's actually asking him, what are you physically doing in this place? Why are you here, in this cave, on this mountain? But Elijah doesn't get it. Look at his response. Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down their altars, killed every one of your prophets, and I'm the only one left, and they're trying to kill me too. This is what he believes. No one's good, everyone's bad, I'm all alone, and I'm going to die soon. 
What are you doing here? I'm having a bad day, man. That's why I'm here. Like, I'm burying my heart in my soul. Lead God's response. Go out to stand, stand before me on the mountain. Get out of the cave. Go to the edge. As the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. The wind began to blow, and you would think the power of God blowing through the place and blowing out the bed. Earth begin to shake. God's going to shake out the bad stuff out of your life. Not that. Fire rages. He's going to burn away the bad things. Nope. Whisper. The voice of God. And that was the voice of God. A gentle whisper. When Elijah heard the whisper, he wrapped his face in his cloak and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. I think when we pray, when we're having the desperate seasons of life, don't we pray for the wind and the earth to move and the fire to burn away? God, I need a big thing because I've got a big problem. Anybody else? I mean, you need to do an earth-shattering, wind-moving rocks, fire-burning away things because the problems I face are huge. And God's like, watch this. You want me to speak to your circumstances, and I want to speak to your heart. Anybody? When somebody whispers, you can't just whisper across the room, can you? You gotta lean in. You gotta get close. Sometimes uncomfortably close. When my kids want to tell me a secret, they get uncomfortably close <laughs> to my ear. And it sounds like they're yelling in my ear when it's just this little whisper, right? And God says, I want you to draw near to me because you've been asking me for the big, but what I really want to do is speak to you in a close relationship. And so he goes out to the cave and the voice said again, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah still doesn't get it. Because he gives the exact same response. He replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down their altars, and killed every one of your prophets, and I'm the only one left, and they're trying to kill me too. Didn't you hear me the first time? <laughs> I'm having a bad day, man. Like, I'm alone. I'm broken. People are dumb. Everybody stinks. Don't you know that, God? Right? But, Elijah, but God was never asking Elijah, what are you doing here? Why are you... Like, tell me all the feelings you're feeling and all the things. He literally wanted to know, why are you physically standing in this place? Why are you physically here? And the Lord said to him, go back the way you came. Because you're not where you're supposed to be. Like, you've literally walked away from where I wanted you to be. Why are you here when you should be there? It's like when your kid sneaks out of bed and you're like, what are you doing here? You're supposed to be there. Whisper. I want to bring the fire sometimes when they're doing that. Anybody? Yes. But a good parent. Look me in the eye. What are you doing here? You're so far off course. In fact, if I weren't nicer and your mom wasn't watching, I'd probably spank you right now. Right? you came because <laughs> that's where you're supposed to be yes. go back the way you came and travel to the wilderness of Damascus when you arrived there anoint Hazia, has that guy to be king of Aram and anoint 
Jehu, grandson of Nimshi, to be the king of Israel and anoint Elisha, the son of Shaphat, from the town of Abel Mahola to replace you as prophet. Anyone who escapes from Haziel will be killed by Jehu, and those who escape Jehu will be killed by Elisha. Yet I will preserve 7,000 others in Israel who have never bowed down to Baal, the false god, or kissed him. Elijah's like, I'm having a bad day. Nobody likes me. They're trying to kill me. Everyone's dumb. They're being stupid. And I'm the only one who actually likes you, God. And what does he do? Completely ignores the rant and says, go back where you came. Why would God do that? He didn't deal with his emotions. He didn't deal with his feelings. The only thing he really addressed was that you actually aren't alone. That's it. That's the only thing he addressed. That, like, he just literally goes, no, you're wrong. Like, we don't like that sort of interaction, do we? And sometimes we will have a conversation with God, and I do believe he does care about our emotions, the way we feel, the circumstances of life. But sometimes we get so comfortable when we lay down on the couch in the counselor's office of God, and we're like, these are all my problems. And he's like, you're wrong. Go do this. That's exactly what he says to Elijah. Why? Because Elijah lost his and when he lost his purpose, he lost the meaning. And he lost the reason that he was getting up in the morning. And he lost the reason that he was living. He lost the things in life that actually drew him closer to God. And when he lost the things that drew him closer to God, he got distance, and he got broken, and he got alone. And he felt like he was end of his life because he had no more purpose left. We as a church, there's two things we want to see in every person's life. Them refreshed and them filled with purpose. Because when you have purpose, it changes the way you look at everything. And I'm not saying the only reason that anxiety or depression is in your life is because you have, don't have purpose. But I'm saying it could be a really good reason. Because when Elijah got broken and he got off course and he got the things in his life that he just wanted to quit on life, it's because he had nothing to live for. And maybe the reason you've been wanting to quit on whatever your relationship is, your, your situation is, your finances are, your job, whatever, maybe the reason you've actually been wanting to quit is because you don't have anything to live for. You're gonna, and you're trying to find something to live for. But you're not going to find the thing to live for in this world. There's no job that's going to fix it. There's no partner that's going to fix it. There's no, no medication that's going to fix purpose. The only thing that can give you purpose to get you up in the morning and bring you true fulfillment in your life is a gift and the call of God upon your life. Because it doesn't end. It doesn't end. Now, side note. Depression. I've dealt with it. There's a lot of people who dealt with it. And there is a chemical process that happens. But there are other seasons of our life that you've never been depressed in your whole life and you find yourself depressed. Why is that? Maybe, just maybe you're like Elijah. And you just got out of position. You got to a place that you wanted to go. You left everyone else behind. And you found yourself just kind of going, God, I don't get it. I don't know what's going on. And God looks at you today and he goes, go back the way you came. Because I'm not done with you're still alive, you're still breathing, so I'm not going to take your life from you. I'm actually going to give you more purpose and give you something to live for. Right? The gift that God gave him was life. And not life as in new life, as in like he gave his life to Christ new life, but new life as in new things to live for. And all of us have that opportunity before us. All of us have something to live for in Christ. And it might take you a little while to discover it. It took me a little while. And that's okay. Don't give up the fight. Go to the cave if you need to go to the cave. Lean into the whisper and listen for the voice of God. Why do you think we do a week of prayer every year? Ah, surprise, I'm going to do it twice here. I haven't told you that yet. <laughs> yes, bring it. Why do you think we're doing this week of prayer? It's because yeah. we've been in the cave. Across a room this size, a bunch of people in a bunch of different circumstances in life. You may not have a relationship with God, God at all, or you've been in a relationship with God for 50 years. I know we've got all of that in this room and everything in this room, right? But the two things we learned today is if you're far from God, you can come home. Because the Father's been waiting for you. And it doesn't matter if you smell like pig. 
case. It doesn't matter if you took from him and never returned it. He wants to see you and is welcoming you back in the family. And there's a party that's about to happen when you do that. The other thing we learned today is if we're struggling in life and we felt lost and broken in the journey, that God has a purpose and a plan for your life and he's telling you, go back to what I called you to. Some of the greatest wisdom anybody has ever given me is when you don't know what to do next, just do what God said last. When you don't know what to do next, just do what God said last. Because he's, I know he's already put something on your heart. I know that at some point in your life, there's been a calling and a purpose and a direction in you. And you may have been years since you thought about it. it in fact, that dream seems so dead. You're like, no, nope, there's got to be a new one out there somewhere. And God's going, go back where you came. That book that I told you to write 20 years ago, it's not going to write itself. That relationship that I asked you to restore, someone's got to make the first move, and I'm choosing you. There's all kinds of opportunity for purpose out there, all kinds of opportunity for healing and restoration and direction in life. So maybe for you, it's time to go home. Maybe for you, it's time to go back the way you came. But I know every person in this room today has a response of some sort. Maybe you're on a mission, maybe you're on purpose. And you just need to start running even faster in that direction. Start leaning in even more and finding more life and more meaning and more fulfillment in it. Whatever the case may be, there's something there for you. So here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to close with a moment of prayer. And then uh, Leah will come up and she'll dismiss us. But I want you guys to take a, a serious moment. Because we got this week of prayer coming ahead. we got resources online. Every single day, I've got the videos for you. Time of prayer set aside. What are you chasing down this weekend? Is it you going home? Is it you finding a purpose? Is it you leaning even deeper into that purpose? What's it going to be? Let's decide right now. So if you could close your eyes, bow your heads. Take a moment to listen to the voice of God. But I especially want to speak to those of you who may be far from God. You feel like you're the prodigal. You've been living in the pig pen. You're far from him. You don't know what's ahead of you. And you don't even know if the Father wants you back. But I'm here today to tell you, God wants you back. He's been looking for you. He's been preparing the party for your return. And me, your brother, the people in this room, your brothers and sisters, we're here to celebrate, not condemn those who walk through the doors in need refresh in need of a relationship with God. So that's you. I want you to pray with me. I want you to return home to the Father today. You pray something like this, Father, today I'm coming home. I've wandered and I've journeyed and I've sinned against you. And today I pray that you forgive me of all of that. That I may be called your son, your daughter. Father, I pray that the joy of salvation would come to me, that new life would come to me, and that I would see new purpose, new things to live for. Because I want to live in you and for you. Thank you, Jesus. And you're awesome. Says.